welcome to Money Matters, this week's edition of Money Matters Today. I'm your host, Doug Hepburn with Hepburn Financial Advisors, and we're offering securities and investment advisory services through Satara Advisors, member FINRA, SIPC, and uh, Satara is not affiliated with any other named entity. I'd like to bring in my guest host this week, which is Dave Emery from Planning Capital Management. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing real well, Doug. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. What's been happening in your world? What are clients asking about in your world? Well, I guess uh, one of the big things that, that I see recently is on clients' minds is the is the the, the $3 trillion um, package that's going through Congress right now. Um, and in particular, what they're concerned with is, is taxes. So, um, um, you know, of one course. of the big things we can we can talk a little bit about that. You know, one of the big things it's it's not you know it's not law. So, I, one of the big things we say is you know plan for you know plan for reality, but understand what could be. So, um, right. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure you're probably seeing seeing that too. The there's uh, a lot of implications the, there. Uh, not only the the major concerns about tax increases. I don't care mm-hmm. what anybody tells you that. Uh, saying that it's not going to cost anything. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no free lunch in this world. We all know that. <clears throat> um, I think the biggest concern on a lot of people's minds, uh, aside from taxes, the second biggest is what's it going to do to the debt and the deficit? Uh, yeah. Because more government debt is just going to drive up interest rates. So, yeah, you're right. And at a time now where the Fed is starting to, you know, signal that they're going to raise rates that's um Mm -hmm. that's created some bumpiness in the markets yeah no absolutely i mean i'm not hearing as much people are concerned about about the whole spending and the debt but i'm hearing more is like all right how much is my taxes going to go up what do i need to think about what i need to be concerned with and really you know like i said it's it's not law so what as of right now from what you know we've been reading and seeing it's high income families are the ones that that Right. Potentially are going to see their taxes go up. Uh, the one thing I find kind of a little interesting, too, that um, I just recently heard is that the, 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 the thing they call the SALT deduction. I'm sure you, you know about that, but that, that really has not. Taxes. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, writing off your, your taxes on your um, itemized deductions. That has not been in the package, from what I understand. And um, so that's uh, it usually when that went through, that was a big hot button. And I'm kind of surprised that, that it's not. But who knows what's going to end up? Well, you know what they say. Anytime legis- watching legislation made in Washington is like watching sausage being made. <laughs> you know, you, it, it may taste good at the end, but you don't want to see it happen. You don't want to know what's in it either, right? Exactly. <laughs> so. Exactly. But um, so, yeah, we're, you know, I guess that's one of the things we've heard. And the, the other thing um, on people's minds on the taxes is on the estate planning side of things, too. Um, oh, know, yeah. The, the, uh, the, you know, what's right now going you know, in Congress is reducing the estate tax threshold from like 11.7 million down to five point something infl- you know, in- yep. increase with inflation. So that's that's also been a pretty big hot button too um you know people saying well should i gift money away now and uh, like i said earlier i mean it's one of those things you got to plan for reality i mean just understand yeah. what, what could ha- happen and you need to be nimble to make make some changes if you need to yeah well you know as as i always tell clients you know if you if you want to gift money now just make sure you can afford it yep it's, makes sense. but it's money that you don't need yep because you, you got to know once you give it away, you can't get it back. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's a one way street kind of. It's usually pretty tough. Exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 So. Well, the, the low interest rate environment has actually created a lot of opportunity for, mm-hmm. for those people who are business owners, not only yeah. from a planning perspective, mm-hmm. because they can do some of the more uh, um, advanced techniques like grads mm-hmm. or cruts. Right you know, grantor retained mm-hmm. annuity trusts right. or, or charitable remainder trusts. Uh, but also it's, it's fueled uh, a buying binge by uh, uh, venture capital firms mm-hmm. and private equity firms to buy up private companies. In fact, right. I just had a client come in today saying that they got an offer uh, to buy out their company because interest wow. rates are so low mm-hmm. and, 
you know, if you can, if you can grow a company and reduce your sales, sales, general and administrative costs, uh, you get economies of scale and you can mm-hmm. be more efficient. So, yeah. you know, the question is how long is that going to continue? Cause right. when the Fed takes the punch bowl away, you know, everybody's going to be rushing to get the last dance in. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think kind of your point about inflation, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, you hear on economists say, is it, is it just temporary or not? I mean, right. Um, you know, a lot of people think it's, it's, it's going to be temporary. I'm not quite sure I'm in that camp. Um, but, uh, uh, I think the other thing too, is that inflation has been so low for so long of a time period that having any inflation, people are quite, alarmed about it. I mean, you know, if you look back over time, over, over history, you know, what we have, the inflation we have today is, is relatively, you know, it's, it's certainly not like what it was in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, right. So it's, 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 it's more than what it used to be, but it's, it's nothing, you know, outrageous. So. Right. And definitely not what it was in the Weimar Republic where people were, <clears throat> you know, getting a, a wheelbarrow full of, full of currency to go buy a loaf of bread. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens in yeah. the next six to 12 months. Or exactly. as the Chinese would say, may you live in interesting times. I think, <laughs> I, think we, uh, I, I think we're experiencing that now. I think you're right. So, yeah. Have have you had any unique situations come up in your practice <clears throat> recently? I guess, uh, you know, just kind of reflecting before we came on today. Um, yeah, taxes are, are one thing. Um, uh, yes, I, I've seen similar, you know, inquiries on people buying businesses or buying real estate because of the low interest rate environment. But but the other air, area that I see more and more of is client, you know, prospective clients becoming very well educated on the marketplace for financial planning and choosing to seek out planners that are fiduciary or fee only. Um, Absolutely. So, they, um, so that's something which to me is wonderful because that's the business model that, that I'm part of. But I, right. I just had a client found me on the internet um, this, just this last week. And I asked him, how'd you find, you know, how'd you come across me? And he said, well, I sought out a fee only financial planner and you were, you know, you're clo- close to where I um, I'm living and, you know, I'm getting close to retirement and I need to have a plan. So that, that's, you know, the fee only is the one big thing and being a fiduciary. And the second big thing that I'm seeing is people that are in their fifties, 50, 55, that they want to have a plan so that they can transition toward retirement. You know, they may not be wanting to do a a cliff retirement, like, you know, kind of use my father as an example of that. My father had a a date in in time where he, he retired. That's it. A lot of times these people don't want, to, they want to do something different, but they want to have a plan so they understand what you know what their lifestyle is going to look like moving forward. Well, they're they're getting into the red zone, and the reality yeah. is, you know, you got to you got to know where your point on the horizon <clears throat> is long before you get there. That's right. Well, we we generally get a question each week from All right. uh, our viewers, and this week's question comes from Paul Nance of Philadelphia. Could you give me a few tips on saving <clears throat> money on college costs? Wow, that's uh, yeah. That I, I get that regularly too. Uh, one, one of the big areas I tell clients is to, is to start planning early. College is is uh, the way to reduce college costs is to have a plan throughout the all four years of college, and the best way to do that is to start when your student is in high school, preferably ninth grade, tenth uh, grade. Have an understanding of of what your family can afford, who's going to be involved in paying for it. And what asp- from what aspects of uh, these, you know, you're going to you're going to fund college, meaning are you going to um, take on student loan debt? Are you going to pay for it out of cash flow? Do you have savings and can you qualify for financial aid? So those are the four big areas to consider when you're when you're looking for colleges. Um, have an idea of what you can qualify for financial aid can be large. You know, use other people's money to help fund your students education if you can. And then the other thing I, I also say is, um, you know, if, if you need help with this, you know, hire somebody that understands all these areas plus the tax area. There's avenues to reduce your, your taxes around college, freeing up dollars instead of sending them to the government, you're using, you can use them to pay for college. So those are some of the areas sure. to consider, I'd say. 
You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Well, right now, I'd like to introduce our, our guest for the week, which is Vahan Janjigian. PhD and CFA and Chief Financial Office, Chief Investment Officer from Greenwich Wealth Management. Bahan, <clears throat> thanks for coming on board today. Thanks for having me, Doug. <clears throat> so tell me, uh, we saw stocks sell off in September. And, um, you know, some people said there's really no surprise to that. I mean, we've had a phenomenal year uh, in returns. And you know, the average return in September since 1950 is negative. But you think there are fundamental reasons why uh, we might be seeing this sell off in stocks? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you're right. Uh, if you look at monthly returns over long periods of time, uh, September is the only <clears throat> month that has had a negative average return. So, uh, you know, at this time of the year, every time we start approaching September, the media starts warning us about this. Um, but, you know, stock prices don't go up or down just because the seasons change. There, there usually are fundamental reasons behind it. Right. And, and that was the case uh, this September. So when we began September, the yield on the 10-year Treasury was around 1.3%. And by the time September ended, we were above 1.5%. Hmm. And generally speaking, when interest rates are rising, even though they're still, you know, historically very low, when interest rates are rising, that's usually not... A good thing for stocks, but but there were other things that happened too in September. Um, if you look at uh, American society over the years, um, we've had a number of institutions that we had tremendous respect for that we no longer respect. You know, mm. for example, um, politicians and journalists at one time were very highly respected people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's no longer the case. But the one institution that has uh, continued to be strongly respected has been the Federal Reserve. But in September, right. we saw some scandal with the Fed. There were um, a couple of uh, Fed officials who had to resign because they were involved in trading securities um, yep. that could be affected by Federal Reserve policies that they were uh, they were um, involved with. Uh, we've since You're kidding heard me. That. He's gambling in Rick's <laughs> Cafe. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We've <laughs> since heard that a third official has resigned for the same reason. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, people are worried about the Fed. Um, <clears throat> And then there's also uh, what you guys mentioned earlier, um, you know, Congress is grappling with uh, spending bills. Uh, Democrats are fighting with Republicans, progressive Democrats <clears throat> fighting with moderate Democrats. Um, the government seems to be becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And uh, this does not give investors a whole lot of uh, confidence. And so I think all of these things contributed to the recent weakness in the markets. Yeah, Perhaps right. maybe that has to, something to do with the fact that the uh, the fiscal year end for the government is always September 30th, and Congress, in its infinite wisdom, waits till the last minute to do any kind of budget uh, uh, budget bills right. and tries to sock everything together in one omnibus budget or a reconciliation bill, yes. just so that they can can put ornaments on the Christmas tree. <laughs> yeah, not, not to mention the debt ceiling, which is always uh, a problem. Exactly. That's yeah, another thing exactly. we're dealing with right now. So, uh, yeah. so, so why is inter are interest rates usually bad for stocks, stock well, valuations? You know, yeah, there are two reasons for that. Um, first of all, you can think of asset classes as constantly competing with one another. So, you know, the two uh, major asset classes are stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. um, when interest rates are high, you know, people ask themselves, well, why should I take the risk of being in the stock market? Mm -hmm. If I can get, let's say, 10% uh, per year with government bonds, why should I take mm -hmm. the risk of buying stocks? When interest rates are very low, uh, stocks become much more attractive. Mm -hmm. so, so when interest rates start rising, <clears throat> stocks become relatively less attractive, even when mm -hmm. rates are low. 
But the other big reason is that when you look at valuation analysis, uh, you know, theoretically, the value of any asset is simply the present value of the future expected cash flows. So when interest right. rates are rising, that present value is decreasing. So if you hold everything else constant, mm -hmm. um, you would expect stocks to be worth less. You would expect any asset to be worth less as interest rates rise. So is there any any stocks in particular that do worse? I mean, growth value and any comments around that? Yeah, exactly. You know, we've gone through a long period of time where growth stocks have outperformed value stocks. Mm -hmm. And if you notice during that same period of time, interest rates were falling. Um, mm -hmm. Rising interest rates are worse for growth, growth stocks than they are for value stocks because um, growth companies are companies that are expected to have their future cash flows occur in the distant future, whereas value stocks, their future cash flows are more likely to occur in the near future. So the further out in the future those cash flows are, the less valuable they become as interest rates increase. Isn't it also true that, you know, with uh, value stocks, which are generally dividend paying stocks, mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you're paying a dividend of two or three uh, percent, that to, to get that kind of yield on a on a bond, you've got to go out 20, 30 years. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah. But again, uh, you can think of dividends as being another form of cash flow. So, so yeah. uh, mm -hmm. we typically think of a discounted cash flow analysis uh, when we're valuing stocks and dividends are a piece of those cash flows. So if a, if a company is paying a lot of dividends, those cash flows are occurring earlier and therefore they're more valuable. Makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I know one of the issues that, that we talked about earlier, and it keeps coming up in conversations, is the threat of inflation. Um, I mean, we, we were told that uh, just because of these supply chain shocks, the disruptions that, oh, it's going to be transitory. Inflation is not going to not going to be here forever. Um, but now people are starting to think, well, maybe inflation is here to stay. And there's even fears that we could be seeing 1979, 1980 again. What are your thoughts on that, John? Well, I, I, I actually think the Fed is right when they say that um, inflation is, is transitory because you, you really have to understand what the Fed means by transitory. We've gone through a long period of time when inflation was very low, but we had inflation. Um, inflation right. is simply a measure of the rate of change in prices. Now, all of a sudden, the rate of inflation has gone up. We're running currently around 6%. Um, so if we go from 2% to 6% and then back to 2%, prices continue to rise, but inflation was transitory. So right. um, I hear a lot of people say that um, you know, it's not going to be transitory because the prices are not going to go back down. The companies are not going to take back the wage increases. We're going to have to live with all that. But, but that's not the same thing, because if prices went back down, then we're not talking about inflation. We're talking about, we're talking defl about deflation. Right. Yeah. So I think what's going to happen is that as the supply chain constraints are addressed, you know, we've got serious supply co chain constraints right now with, you know, semiconductors, which are affecting all kinds of products. We've got ports that are, you know, backed up as those constraints are addressed and things start getting back to normal. I think the rate of inflation will come down, but prices will continue to go up, but simply at a lower rate. I guess the, the one thing to consider here is that, you know, a, a little bit of inflation is probably a good thing because the alternative is deflation, right. which is really people <laughs> not spending money, expecting prices to be lower next week. That's and exactly so, what happens, yeah. And, and once you get into a deflationary spiral, the economy just grinds to a halt. We saw that back in the Great Depression. Right. Yeah. So, and then I don't think anybody wants to relive that. No, yeah. but even even a few years ago, um, you know, people were putting off buying things like cars because right. they expected next year's model to be better and at the same price or maybe even a little less. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants to buy cars. Uh, there's no problem with demand. It's just that you can't you can't get the cars. They're not a supply. <laughs> yeah. Even even used cars are, are going at surprisingly high prices. And we're not talking, um, you know auctions for for classic cars that's and right exactly it, we're talking just regular regular everyday models out there so uh, so, so you talked about inflation and deflation but what about stagflation um you talk a little bit about that 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of concern about stagflation right now. Stagflation refers to the situation where you have inflation combined with slowing growth. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, you also have rising unemployment. Um, and, we, and we certainly seem to be in that kind of condition right now. Um, in fact, if you look at uh, growth forecasts, you know, we knew we were going to have a huge rebound after the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And then we expected things to start normalizing. But um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, which often puts out growth forecasts, they started off uh, forecasting more than 6% 6 growth for the, mm -hmm. the third quarter. And they've since decreased that to only 1.3%. So we're, now we're in a situation where growth <clears throat> certainly seems to be slowing um, while we have pretty strong inflation. Um, Again, that's not something I'm really that concerned about because I do believe that all of this is being caused by the supply constraints. Mm -hmm. I mean, everywhere I look, I see that demand is very strong. And once companies are able to satisfy the demand, I think growth will resume mm -hmm. and inflation will come back down. Okay. Um, interesting. So is there, is there anything in particular the, the investors should think about regarding stag inflation, you know, regarding stocks or investments in general? Yeah, well, stagflation is a really uh, bad situation. Um, if you do believe that uh, we are going to be in a period of prolonged stagflation, you probably would want to reduce your exposure to equities uh, significantly. Um, and I think some of the volatility that we've been seeing in the market right now is just a reflection of investors trying to mm -hmm. uh, make decisions about this. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now, Bahan, I know a lot of uh, professional inv investment professionals have different ways of looking at stocks. You have technical analysts, you have fundamental analysts, and uh, as two broad categories. How do you look at uh, and evaluate stocks that you hold for your client portfolios? Okay, yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, I am a fundamentalist because I'm primarily a long-term investor. I think technical analysis uh, can be very useful for short-term investors. Um, I'm not a trader. I, when I make a decision to buy a stock, uh, I typically establish a position. I actually hope the price goes lower so I can add to that position. And my intention is to hold it for a long period of time. So when I'm constructing portfolios for my clients, I'm relying mm -hmm. primarily on, on fundamental analysis. Um, you know, I'm looking at things like... Uh, you know, the industry, the management of the company. But most importantly, I do a uh, discounted cash flow analysis. And I'm very interested in buying stocks that I think are undervalued. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're value stocks because a, a growth stock could also be undervalued. So I'm mm, looking for sure. stocks that I think are simply selling for less than they're worth. And so I do a uh, conservative discounted cash flow analysis. And um, I construct portfolios for my clients all in separately managed accounts. And each portfolio is structured for that client, taking into consideration all of their, um, all of their uh, you know, characteristics, most importantly, how much risk they're uh, able mm -hmm. to uh, tolerate. And so some of my clients, for example, might have portfolios that are 50% equities, 50% fixed income, and other clients might be 100% equities. Uh, because they also have money invested elsewhere in more conservative assets. Um, right. I use a combination of uh, exchange-traded funds and uh, individual stocks. Uh, some clients have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, exchange-traded funds in their portfolios. Uh, some have very few. Some have more individual stocks. Um, I use exchange-traded funds to get exposure to uh, things like um, you know international markets where I don't have a lot of expertise and it's very difficult to analyze uh, these kinds of companies. Um, but I'll also use them to get exposure to certain sectors. Like for example, right now, um, I think that uh, one area that's very undervalued is um, the financial companies. And these are companies that should do well as, um, as interest rates rise. So instead of buying individual financial companies, I'm buying uh, financial exchange traded funds. Interesting. So um, uh, kind of along those lines, are there, is there any stocks in particular that, that you find particularly appealing at this time? Yeah, actually, um, there are a few. Uh, I'll give you two that are, uh, you know, well-known names and a third that's not so well-known. Uh, so, so one of my favorite stocks right now is, is IBM. Um, I like this company for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's really been out of favor for a long period mm -hmm. of time. 
And, uh, but it is a blue chip company. It has uh, tremendous cash flows. It's a technology company, but it's a technology company selling at a value price. Um, they are making a big transition. Uh, they've been doing this for a number of years, but it's really picking up steam. They're moving ahead into data analytics and cloud computing, and they seem to be having quite a bit of success at that. Hmm. Um, and uh, pretty soon they're going to have a spinoff as well, and they pay a, a great dividend currently about four and a half percent. So every time I see the stock dip, I add it to the portfolios. When it rallies quite a bit, I start trimming. So that's one stock I really like. Hmm. Uh, another well-known name I, I really like um, that's done exceptionally well uh, this year is uh, Ford Motor Company. Um, I think people have really underestimated Ford's ability to move into the electric vehicle business. Um, <clears throat> they are having these supply chain constraints that we discussed earlier. Um, but they're coming out with an electric pickup truck, the Lightning, and uh, they're having trouble building it. But uh, they've got over 150,000 reservations for this truck, and it's going to sell for probably $70,000 a feet. Wow. They're going to do uh, quite well with that. And the stock has really responded. And I still think it's undervalued. Ford, by the way, used to pay a great dividend. They've suspended that dividend. But I would expect that once they start selling these trucks, the dividend's going to come back. And then a third stock that I really like is in the energy business. That's another area that's really been out of favor and uh, became very undervalued. Uh, this is called Murphy Oil. It's, a, um, it's an exploration and production company, um, and their stock price is correlated with the price of oil. And as we've seen oil prices go up, their stock price has gone up quite a bit too. Uh, even though the stock's currently up probably about 120% year to date, hmm. um, I still think it is undervalued at current prices. Thank you. That sounds great. Yeah, very, very interesting. You've obviously done your homework, Rahan, uh, and and we appreciate that. We recommend that all uh, all viewers do their homework, talk to their investment advisors, your tax advisors, and your legal advisors, and make sure that you get uh, the best advice you possibly can, even from multiple sources of uh, of information before you make a decision. Um, now, Vahan, I I hear a rumor that you're also a, a, a track and field aficionado. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I ran track for many years myself, and my uh, my daughter is currently a runner at MIT. So yeah, track. That's good. great. Fantastic. Congrats. So so who was who was the the best track athlete at the Tokyo Olympics? Um, well, the best athlete, in my opinion, was a young lady by the name of a Thing Mo. Uh, she won the uh, 800 meters, uh, got the gold medal, broke the American record, also anchored the uh, women's 4x4 for another gold medal. And uh, I'm a little bit biased because when my daughter was in high school, she actually ran against this young lady. So uh, we've got some pictures of them running together in a race, and that's, uh, that was very exciting for us. That's great. Oh, okay. So are is, is that one of your investments that you're hoping? <laughs> if, I, if I could invest in track and field, I would. <laughs> well, maybe the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Hopefully it'll be worth something. something yeah, you, you could get it signed. <clears throat> yeah. There you go. Well, that's it for today's show. I just want to announce our next guest is Anthony, going to be Anthony B. Miles of Urban Healthcare. He's a real estate developer and... Um, you know, I hear we've got a really good show with him. Would love to see it myself. I'm looking forward to it. But uh, again, you know, at Money Matters today, we feel that it's important to get the information out to you because your money matters. Make sure you talk to your advisors, whether they're tax, legal, or investment advisors. And if you have to, get a second opinion before you make any decisions because you want to make sure whatever you do, it's right for you.